you're watching Legal Focus, and our advocate for this week is renowned international prosecutor Charles Adeogu Phillips. And we're here in his law firm. You're welcome, Mr. Charles Adeogu Phillips. Thank you. We usually start from the beginning in getting to the world of uh, our advocate for the week. And um, so let's go to the beginning and how childhood shaped your eventual emergence as uh, your career in law generally. Well, um, as you know, I grew up on a university campus. My father was um, a professor of law at the University of Lagos. So I spent my formative years um, growing up at the University of Lagos campus, surrounded by students. My mother is a nurse at the University of Lagos Teaching Hospital. Mm -hmm. And I guess growing up in a university community um, kind of gave me that sort of background. Um, an interest in succeeding in life. I, I, I'm not so sure I, I wanted, I set out to be a lawyer. Like every, every kid, I uh, was interested in public relations. Then I wanted to be a pilot so I could fly the whole world. And then I was, uh, I was woeful at, 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 at physics. <laughs> so, so that wasn't going to happen. Then I toyed with advertising and all sorts of things. And I eventually, by default, ended up studying law. But my father had nothing to do with it, by the way. So when you found yourself, you know, having to study law, having to uh, follow that path, what about your legal influences beyond, you know, parental? Can you, can you think back to that period, uh, anyone sticking out? Well, quite a, quite a bit. I mean, studying law at university, um, Lord Denning and reading about cases divided, uh, decided by Lord Denning, both in the family uh, division of the High Court um, and in uh, other, other cases as well and reading about the way he reasoned um, cases like Cons v. Cons, Voland, William Voland. And there were so many uh, cases of equitable interest in, in, in property and how uh, Lord Denning would reason that even though a spouse was unemployed, um, she contributed to the making of the matrimonial home and therefore um, was entitled to an equi equitable interest in, in, in that home. But so growing up and going through university, and reading all those cases, um, one developed a, a profound interest. But as it happens, I, I have ended up practicing in international criminal law. But I hated criminal law as a student. I actually just didn't like criminal law. Um, so it, it's actually quite interesting that I ended up actually prosecuting uh, at the international court. And I, I, I'm a member of the international bar for a subject area that I never actually liked when I was at school. Now, this is the second time that you've been talking about something you hate. Uh, <laughs> all right, but let me try and, you know, follow, the, follow your pace now. Uh, so, after school, your legal training, by the way, was in the UK. Uh, so, after school now, uh, what was Twitter age like? Did you um, have to, you know, serve in a firm, so to speak? I first qualified as a solicitor in the United Kingdom. And before you qualify as a solicitor, you're required to do a two-year period of um, training with a firm of solicitors and then you qualify um, and interestingly enough I, I was trained in one of the largest black firms in the UK at the time um, which was owned by a man called Ned Nwoko which you, you probably have heard of he, he later returned to Nigeria and became a politician or he is a politician in those days um, Ned, Ned owns the largest black law firm in London in the city of London by the way and um, a lot of us um, who are unable to get placements in bigger law firms um, were very fortunate um, to have gotten placements in his firm and that was why we were able to qualify because without the training contract you're actually unable to qualify it's not just passing the law exams but you actually need to serve a two-year period of of tutelage and in those days it, it was very hard to come by uh, nobody just was interested in training um, Africans because they probably thought well, we would just get the training and just return to our home countries and we'd be of no benefit to the system and there were very few black law firms at the time um, talk to talk less of in the city of London uh, where, where Ned was located so we were very fortunate I, well, I personally was very fortunate to have practiced and been trained in his firm. True and that experience now is what I don't know how you're going to sum up that experience you know within this time that we have now. But what were the key moments for you? Or tell us about that time. Well, first of all, the training that I received in the UK is what put me in good stead for what I was eventually 
going to do at the UN. Um, the whole reason why the UN was interested in me was because of my background. But you applied? In, in crim oh, yes, I did, of course, um, in, in, criminal, in criminal defense work in the UK. Um, at the time, I had no idea what prosecuting genocide would have been like. Um, I remember leaving the very the comfort of my of my home and life, by the way, in London, uh, to get on a flight to Rwanda, um, with no expectation whatsoever. And when I started the work, we started with the field work. We had two offices, we had three offices. We had the Hague office, we had the Rwanda office, which was the field where the genocide had taken place, and then we had the courts in Arusha, Tanzania. So we all resumed work in, um, in uh, Kigali and part of the introduction to the work was visiting and working from the actual sites where the massacres had taken place um, and that was difficult because you see the Rwandans had left because no one believed that the genocide had actually taken place so the Rwandans had actually left the bodies where the people had been killed and I'll have you know that there were many more people killed in churches than anywhere else. So when I was assigned to investigate, I mean, I'm prosecuting, but I have to investigate what I'm going to prosecute, and I have to familiarize myself with the massacre sites, I had to go from one massacre site to another massacre site, taking stock of what had taken place. But I was shocked that the actual bodies had actually been mummified because they had this um, acidic chalk that was thrown on them, and they were just left in the positions where they were when the massacres took place. Was that a deliberate act? Yes, because there was, there was the denial of genocide. Rwanda went through this period where people didn't actually believe what had taken place. And it was a direct policy of state to actually leave those crime scenes the way they were so that the world could come and see it. And it was only many years afterwards, when we had carried out our initial investigations, that they decided to create monuments. If you look at one of the pictures that I have with on the, the internet, with the skulls behind me. Now, that was one of the massacre sites that I was prosecuting and investigating. At that time, they had now packed all the bodies. But they were still located at that site. They just opened up a room. And rather than the bodies, they now arrange the scores on shelves. But, but is it that while the bloody war was going on, outsiders were not so willing or chanced to come and see the war for themselves? Why did such a bloody period in a nation's history have to come with so much uh, disbelief? Because the events in and of themselves were almost beggars they actually almost beggar belief because you see you don't you cannot begin to imagine the the scale of man's inhumanity to, to man. man right and that is why when i when i start hearing hate speech in nigeria and people being very reckless in their speech this tribe against this tribe this religion against this religion i shudder and I ask myself, do people actually understand that these things are capable of forming the basis of direct and public incitement to commit some of these heinous crimes? Because that's how it all started. Tutsis were called nicknames as cockroaches and Ienzis and this and that. And it all started with propaganda and just maligning another ethnic group and all that. And it very quickly just skyrocketed and snowballed out of control. So you, you went to Rwanda firsthand. You saw all uh, the relics of, of I had, that I time. Lived, I lived in Rwanda. And for how long? Um, off and on for almost 10 years. So how easy was it prosecuted? No, it wasn't. So in, in all of this, you were on a very delicate mission to get justice for these victims. Absolutely. Seeing the sensitivity of that time, would you say you were successful? in that bid? Yes, I was. In the fact that uh, I am one of very few people that um, had the, the benefit. Because genocide trials are very long. 
they take between two or three years. I actually, in my career, my 12 and a half year career, I actually led 12 genocide trials. And I got convictions in 11 of them, apart from one. So that for me, the personal success story of being able to ensure that justice was not only done, but was seen by Rwandans to have been done. And I think that is important when you're dealing with transitional justice. And one of the drawbacks of international courts and tribunals is that those trials are taking place at locations so far away from where the victims suffered these attacks. And they're unable to actually follow. And in our case, we had an outreach system. The, the UN court had an outreach system with Rwanda. But I also took it upon myself to always go back into the villages of Rwanda to meet with my witnesses and inform them how the case had turned out. So I would always insist that I want to, be, to go back and tell my witnesses, oh, we got a conviction in that case. Your testimony was very good. It helped us to convict him. He's serving life. And, you know, they were always very happy for that feedback. Well, congratulations on that. But what about down moments uh, recorded in your career? Uh, how do you deal with that? Difficult. It's, it's very difficult because, I mean, of course, um, you do not realize how much damage um, has been caused by the um, stories that you've heard. Um, you're working with a witness. Um, she's telling you how she was raped or how she witnessed somebody else being raped in the same room and how after she had been raped her stomach was cut open. I mean, you go to bed at night and you think about this. You're a prosecutor, so you're going to structure your case for court the next day. You have to read your notes and structure the evidence. But the evidence is gruesome. Um, it also involves a lot of videos and documentaries and forensic evidence that we have to present before the courts. So you're looking at pictures of an excavation of a mass grave where the cadavers are still almost intact and where the witness is only identifying her sister or her daughter by the clothes. Well, they call them kangas. They're like what we call Ankara here. So she would say, that was my daughter's kanga. I remember that kanga because I bought it for her for her fifth birthday. And that's all she has. And that's all she has. And we're excavating this, this, this cadaver from a mass grave. And the soil in Rwanda was very rich. And the genocide took place during the rainy season. So for some reason, the bodies were preserved until we got there. And some of the evidence is that gruesome. Because to be able to, the first challenge we had was to actually convince the judges that a genocide took place. So the very first trials that we had, we had to call forensic evidence. And that involved excavating mass graves to show the scale of this atrocity. But once the first two pronouncements were made, the courts were willing to take judicial notice of the fact that a genocide had actually occurred in Rwanda and we didn't have to prove that any longer. But because we started the work, we had that arduous task of proving that a genocide actually occurred. We've been speaking with international prosecutor Charles Adeogu Phillips and he's been filling us in on his very crucial and intricate work as an international prosecutor uh, investigating and prosecuting the heinous crimes in Rwanda. We'll have more in a moment. Stay with us.